I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 11. We're uh, looking again at verse 28. Matthew chapter 11, uh, verse 28. I want to begin reading again at verse 25. So uh, we'll read from verse 25 down through the end of the chapter. It's a phenomenal passage. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and of earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus bathe us in this passage tonight, of the reality of all that it means and is in you be experienced in us. Surround us, O oh God, in a world of turmoil and stress and pressure, in the midst of a society that is wearing us out, in the midst of a world, a religious world that heaps burden after burden upon us, in the midst of church organizations that demand so much out of us? Oh, God, oh, God, could we experience you, Jesus, in your fullness? Could we find all that you are in all, all that we are and find it is rest for our souls? Please, bathe us. Let this very moment tonight be a time of refreshment for us. Please, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for your patience. We're looking at verse 28. Come to me. Uh, we came to some conclusions in the last uh, few times that we've dealt with this. And one conclusion that we came to strongly is the idea that come is definitely an invitation. It is not a command. He is not demanding anything. He is not wagging his finger in our face. He's not making us do anything. This is not a forceful thing. This is coming from the, a one who is gentle and lowly in heart. And it is an invitation from his heart to your heart. And it is an invitation to come. We discovered that the to come to is not for you to go from where you are to arrive where he is because you are incapable of doing that. The Greek word is prose and it literally means or has the idea of direction. So the whole impact of the word too is that if you'll just turn your head, if you'll just indicate, if you'll just move in his direction, if you'll just start, if you'll just, if you'll just make a, if you'll just respond to his call, so the invitation is given, oh, come, oh, come. And if you make any, any indication of response to that invitation at all, he is all over you. It's the kind of idea of seek and he will find you. It is the kind of idea, knock, and I'll tell you the door will be thrown wide open. You don't need to think for a moment that you need to break it down. If you just knock, he'll throw that thing wide open. If you just ask, oh, he's all over you in giving the answer to the need of your life, just come to, just respond, just indicate. If you even start, it's enough. Just come. Just come to. And, of course, everything depends on who you're coming to, and it's Jesus. He is the one that's giving in the invitation. If I give this invitation, it's ridiculous. If you give this invitation, it doesn't mean much. If this is an invitation from the church, it's a joke. This is an invitation from the heart of Jesus. That literally carries weight with it. 
that makes it so overwhelmingly significant. You want to sit up straight and pay attention to it. It causes everything that is deep within you to respond and say, yes, oh yes, if it's coming from him, maybe I have a chance he would open up his heart to me and say, come, come. Oh, an invitation from Jesus. Who is he? We discovered in verse 27, all things have been delivered to me, he says. So he is the one who possesses all things. Oh, he can afford to invite us to come and share with us, for he has all things. They've been given to him by his Father, and everything that the Father wants you to have is jammed into the person of Jesus, and he possesses it all. I promise you tonight, I promise you tonight, you cannot come to Jesus with the need that he has to say, oh, wait, I'll have to go manufacture an answer for you. <laughs> he does not have to manufacture anything. It has all been done. Everything you need, he has it. All things have been given to him. So the one who's inviting you is the one who has all things. We discovered the intimacy of relationship. Who is he? Not only does he have all things, but oh, see, he, no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. So he's the one that has the intimate relationship with the Father. So you're coming not to, not to one who's mediocre, not who, one who's going to have to investigate, not who want, to one who's going to have to establish. You're coming to one who is such, in such intimacy with the Father that everything the Father is telling him, he has promised, he will tell you. Think of that. The intimacy that he has with the Father, he wants to share with you. You look into his face and you see he is the visible image of the invisible Father. Father. He knows him so well. He is so tight with him. He has become so one with the Father that all that the Father is is literally manifested through him. So to embrace him is to embrace the Father. And in embracing him, the entirety of the nature of the Trinity becomes yours. Oh. He is not inviting you to omnipresence. He is not inviting you to all powerfulness. He's not inviting you to omniscience. Why would you want that? He is inviting you to his heart, his nature. He wants to share the very heartbeat of his being with you. And the invitation is come, not to the power and come, not to the omnipresence, come, not to the great abilities, come, come to my heart. Isn't that where you want to be? Come to all I am in my nature. Come to my holiness. Come to the way I feel. Come to my emotional makeup. Come to the drive of my system. Come to the passion of my heart. Come. Why don't you just come? Come. He is, the Trinity has cracked itself open and has pulled you in to the intimacy of what drives the heart of God. That's for you. That's for you. See, everything else he has, this is who he is. He's not invited you to get in on his possessions. He's invited you to get in on what throbs within his being. He wants you in on the intimacy of who he is, which is phenomenal. It's his nature. We have become partakers of the divine nature. We discovered that this invitation is literally restricted. We discovered it is restricted to a special group. It's not everybody come to me, anybody, anywhere, any place. No, no, this is restricted. If you got your act together, this isn't for you. You're not invited. See, if everything's okay with you, this is not, you're not included in the invitation. Hey, if you don't have any needs, don't worry about this. Don't listen to this. Don't know why you're here. If you don't have any pressure in your life, you don't need to even give this a second thought. This is for the people who labor and are heavy laden. 
that's who this is for. Those who labor and are heavy laden. Those who labor, we discovered, are literally means exhausted. Those who have literally become exhausted, who have worn themselves out. We discovered it's in the active voice, which means I'm responsible for it. I wore myself out. I can't blame anybody else for this. I literally took up burdens and wore myself out. I've been working myself to death. Now, you realize the context of this. The context of this is a religious context. So this is not, I've been at the job and made a lot of money. That's not what he's talking about. This is an exhaustion that's come because I have been working at the business of religion. I have been striving and trying and doing and performing and doing everything I can to meet up to the standards of God, and I'm finding out it is wearing me out. I have studied the laws of God and I've calculated my, uh, what, what needs to be done and I have worked at it and worked at it and they just keep adding another one and another one and there's more responsibility and more responsibility and I literally have just wore myself out trying to meet up to the standards of God. How have you done? <laughs> Oh, the guilt. <laughs> oh, the guilt. I've not done too well. And I'm still exhausted. I was in this revival meeting in Arizona. This lady came up to me. Her and her husband were strong in the church. And she was expressing encouragement over this truth. She said about 10 years ago, my husband and I got saved right out of the raw of sin. Drugs, the whole works, and God just saved us. It was so radical. We were so excited. We got into the church and we got into Bible studies and we began to read the scriptures and we began to grow and we got involved in the church and we began to do things and we became a part of the evangelism of the church and inviting folks and we got involved in the Sunday school class and we got involved in cleaning the church and we got involved in doing this and we got involved in every place there was a need we got involved in and she said after about three or four years with all these meetings and all this and she said we just got burned out with keeping, doing, trying, struggling, just she said, we just burned out and we began to drop out of the church and drop out of Christianity and just begin to, she said, we were out for nearly a year or two, but she said, just recently God has touched us again and we've come back and she said, I saw the same pattern begin to develop. I saw that we were beginning to try to meet up to the standard and we were trying to live up to this and get involved here and do this and do that. And she said, I could just feel the same thing happening within me. I was just getting exhausted. And to think that God could give us rest, that, folks, this is not a struggle. This is a relaxation. This is not a try harder, meet up to the standard deal. This is, whoa, he's pulling me to his level. He's reached out and grabbed a hold of me and pulled me into his heart. That this is not an attempt, get it done. Oh, my, how am I going to? Oh, I've got to pray more. Oh, I've got to work harder. This is a, whoo, embrace tighter and let him do his thing. That this is a rest. If you're worn out, exhausted. Jesus said he saw the multitude as weary, worn out, just 
multitudes of them that had had the burden of legalism just heaped upon them, which is the next statement in the, in the verse. Labor and are heavy laden. That's in the passive voice. It means placing a burden upon someone. I'm not responsible for that. It's been placed upon me. Jesus saw the multitudes as individuals that religion, the Jewish religion, had just heaped this this, these burdens of legalism upon the back of people and they struggled to do them and just, oh, they bore these burdens. It wore them out. So it's my fault. I've exhausted myself. But it's also the responsibility of the religion of my culture and hour that's just heaped all this stuff upon me. No wonder from the outside and the inside I've been beat to death. Come. Well, I'm too tired to move. Just turn your head. Just turn your head. He will meet you there. Oh, isn't that a message? And I have. I will give you rest. Oh, the Greek word is Anna Powell. The struggle in the passage is what is rest? What should I expect when I get it? When Jesus gives this to me, what will it feel like? How will I know when I got it? Will I be able to sense that I have all the rest he wants me to have? Will the nap be long enough? What is this rest? That's the issue of the passage. Well, let's look at it. Let's start with what it is not. Maybe that'll help us. What it is not. First of all, it is not inactivity. We've been accused of that. That Christianity is not doing, it's responding. Oh, you mean I don't have to do anything. I can be inactive. I can sit at home. I can kick my shoes off. If you go to the dictionary and you look up the word rest, it will tell you that rest is ceasing from work or movement in order to relax, rest, recover your strength. That's not what he's talking about. That's not this word. He's not telling you to go to sleep. Wake up! Five people did. Wow. This is not about a nap. This is not about sleeping. This is not what that is. He, he is this, this is not about you go on vacation. This is not take a break. That's not what he's discussing here. That's not the rest that he's talking about. This is not about quitting. This is not about inactivity. This is not about you don't need to pray anymore. This is not about, well, you don't need to come to church anymore. This is not about you don't need to get in the scriptures anymore. Quit your teaching job. Hey, you don't need to be involved. Don't do that. Don't, don't do it. Just, hey, just, just sit in the corner. Just be a couch potato. It's not what he's talking about. It's not even close to what he's talking about. The focus of the whole statement of rest is on the resource, not the activity. In other words, when he's talking about rest, he's talking about, oh, what would happen in your life if a shift in resource could take place? In other words, instead of you resourcing it, what would happen if a resource would come to you that's not you? And you could rest from being the resource. It's interesting in the uh, book of Hebrews chapter 4, he talks about the rest, that we can enter into the rest. He defines the rest. He defines it in terms of God. God created for six days and then rested. Likewise, you also are to enter into his rest. 
Now, if you want to call what God did in creating work, I suppose you could. But you realize what the creation of God was, what the creating ability of God was like. He sat on a throne, thought was his mind, what? And there was, and said, that's enough for today. It's really hard to call that work. This is not grab your lumber, get a ten penny nails, and get to hammer and saw and go to work. I mean, God created and rested from his creating. So the invitation is, oh, quit creating! Creating? Yeah, you're always creating. Well, yeah, I got this problem. I have to create a solution. Oh, I got this need. I got to create an answer. I've got this bill. I got to create funds to pay the bill. I've got to create. I've got to create. I'm always creating. I'm creating problems for other people. I got to do that. I've just got all the, I'm constantly creating. My whole life is filled with creating, creating, creating. He says, quit that. Don't create. Let him create within you. Could there be a shift in resource? So instead of you creating a solution, you turn to him and in resting, leaning back on him. It isn't that you aren't active. It's that you are actively involved in his resource. This is not non-movement. This is a movement that now is going to be energized by a divine God. Can you imagine your life literally being energized by the divine? Oh. Think of that. Jesus being your energy. Rest. It's not inactivity. This is all over the Old Testament. In fact, as you walk through the Old Testament, battle after battle after battle that the Israelites had, they were never inactive. They were always in the middle of it. Active in the battle, but everybody knew they didn't win because they were good warriors. They won because an almighty God brought the victory. They all knew that. I mean, there's hundreds of stories like that. The Second Chronicles chapter 20 is beautiful. The Amorites, the Moabites, and the people of Mount Seir. Each one of those nations, Israel had whipped their armies, and they were sick of it. So they got their three armies together and made one massive army and said, we're going to go get them. And here they came, one massive army. When King Jehoshaphat found out about it, he was scared to death. Oh, he called for a fast and prayed all day long, fasted all day long. And God said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go, all, go and all take a nap. No, he didn't. God said, I want you to line all the people up. Tomorrow morning, I want them all lined up. And here's why I want them lined up. I want the choir out in front. Good night, the choir in front. Yeah, I want the singers right out there leading the parade. Good night. What are we going to do? Sing them, to, sing them to death? Well, something like that. So I want the choir in the front. I want the singers in the front. Then I want all the uh, people in the, I want the congregation uh, following them. And then I want the army the soldiers following up the rear. And as, I, as you go out, I want you to go out singing. And so here came this. This is crazy. Here, see, it's not inactivity. They are acting. But brother, if this comes out all right, we know it isn't anything we dreamed up. And they went on the march singing, and they literally got into the enemy territory. And here's this massive three-army deal going on around them. And what happens? They all get confused to start killing each other while they're just singing praises, Israel singing praises to God. And when the whole thing is over, they say, well, I guess they're all dead. We can go home now. So they sang them to death. And it wasn't inactivity, but something was going on we didn't even break into a sweat. Wow. You exhausted? What would happen if you had a new source? A new source. 
what it is not. He's not, the rest is not about inactivity. Number two, it's not about involvement, non-involvement. No, no. This is not about, well, you just run away. This is not about, well, hide in the corner. One of the great old hymns. Don't you love the old hymns? Oh, just wonderful. The, one of the great old hymns is what? It's about the fort. Hold the fort till Jesus comes. It pictures the church as a little isolated group over in the corner of the, of the, of the town building this fort to keep the devil out. Hey, lock the doors! What? Where did that picture come from? This is about a mighty army on the move. This is not about hide in the corner. This is about, not about don't be involved. This is not about, hey, hide under the bed. That's not what he's talking about when he talks about rest. Come on. This is about involvement. This is about you're going to be in the middle of this. The disciples and Jesus were having great success in Galilee. Oh, mercy, the crowds were just phenomenal. In the amount of miracles, I got to calculating this out the other day, the amount of miracles that were done and the, and the fame that just spread, his fame just spreading everywhere, there isn't any question in my mind that every family, every family in Israel had been affected by the person of, of Jesus. Every family in Galilee had been affected by the person of Jesus. It was massive, folks. I mean, absolutely massive. And they had such great success, and the crowds were clamoring for Jesus, and it was wonderful. Yeah, the leaders of Israel, they're off someplace. But, oh, the people of, of, of Galilee loved him. Then they came to Jerusalem. That was a dumb idea. Because that's the seat of the religious leaders and and they want to kill Jesus and you're walking into their den and this is this is the big city see Galilee is country and farms and fishing and dirt under your fingernails and read comic books and listen to country and western music and you know it's that kind of thing Jerusalem is big city and oh McDonald's on every corner and good night this is you know it's clamoring and get out of the way and honk your horn and all that stuff they're not used to that. Everything was going well in Galilee. Now they've come to Jerusalem. Things are not going well. In a matter of a week, they're hanging him. He's dead, and they've lost their Messiah. The disciples are hiding. Where did it all happen? Jerusalem. How do, what are we going to do about it? Let's get out of here. We didn't have any problems until we came here. See, when we came here, if we'd have stayed in Galilee, we'd have been okay. Let's get out of here. Let's go back home. Let's go back where we know the back alleys. Let's go back where they're of our culture. Let's go back where they talk like us, where they say sangers instead of singers. Let's go back where they talk like us. Come on. Jesus, the resurrected Lord, showed up. He said, don't leave. We want to, no, don't leave. Well, this is, don't leave. Well, the leaders of it, don't leave. Don't leave. Well, this is where all the problems, don't leave. We didn't have a problem until we got, don't you leave. You stay right here. Why? Because it's right here in the middle of Jerusalem where all your problems are. That I'm going to send my spirit and the world and you are going to be changed. And if you go back to Galilee and run away, you won't experience it. Whoa. Come to me, all you who... Rest, want to rest. All you who are laboring and heavy laden, I will give you rest. The rest is not about non-involvement. Well, I just don't want to be. No, stay right here, right in the middle. This is not about hide under the bed. This is not about go to the corner. This is about involvement. And here, in the middle of the involvement, you'll find rest. 
what it is not. Inactivity, involvement, imparted. We already mentioned this, but look at verse 28. And I will give you, give you, give you, give you rest. That's not what he means. The actual Greek word again is on a powell, which is the idea of have rest. So the statement actually says, come to me, all you, here's the invitation, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will rest you. See, give indicates the idea that this is something he has and he's going to give it to you. Listen, I'm going to give you a break. Go off and take a nap and I'll see you when you get up. That's not what he's discussing here. That's not his invitation. This is not, hey, I got a, what is it you drink? Big bull. Red bull. Red bull. <laughs> take a drink. Be energized. That's not what he's talking about. This isn't something he has and he's going to give to you. Oh, this is the old truth. But hey, we seem to constantly forget about it. So we have to keep talking about it all the time. This is about he doesn't have anything to give to you. He is everything you need. He has no power to give you like you could receive it from him and go off and use it and come back and get some more. He is your power. See, he doesn't give you forgiveness. He is forgiveness. He doesn't give you peace. He is your peace. He doesn't give you strength. He is your strength. He does not give you rest. It's in his embrace that you know the resource that flows through your being and rests your system. It's not the change of circumstance. It's not hiding. It's not removing yourself from. It's not inactivity. That's not what he's inviting you to. He's inviting you to the embrace of his person and in him. Oh, I feel better. Rested. Let's take a moment and talk about what it is. We've discovered what it is not. What is he offering to us? The Greek word anapao literally is two words put together. Ana, which means up. In this situation used here, it's an intensifier. So it intensifies the whole idea it also here has the idea of to renew. It's used like we would use the prefix re. Rebuild. Restructure. Redo. In other words, it has the idea of going back and doing it again. So it's the idea you have exhausted yourself. Now I want you to go back and let's start over. <laughs> You have exhausted your energy and got nowhere. Let's back up. Let's re. Let's Anna intensified. Do it again. That kind of idea. The word powell, which is the main word, literally means come to an end. So this is coming to the end of yourself. <laughs> so rest is what? coming to the end of yourself, backing up and saying, oh, let's do this again with you. <laughs> Which is rest. Beautiful. Three ideas spill out of this concept, this word, which describes the rest. Just want to give them to you. One is repose. Repose in the physical sense, in the physical sense, means temporary rest from activity, which again is not what we're dealing with. But if you go to the dictionary and you search your way through, it'll come up with a spiritual definition or an emotional definition, which means that repose is a state of peace. Peace. 
Could it be? Oh, take a concordance and look up all the places where the word peace, Jesus uses the word peace and read his promises to you. Could it be that what Jesus is promising you here is not a nap, not you'll never have to work another day in your life. Could it be what he's promising you here is a state of peace? What would be the opposite of a state of peace? A state of stress. Got any stress in your life? <laughs> I think that doctors, I probably got this from a doctor. We got nurses here, I shouldn't say this. I think that the doctors would tell you that nobody ever had a heart attack because they worked hard. They have heart attacks because they had stress. It wasn't physical labor, it was the stress that what ruins us in our whole physical makeup and destroys us both physically and spiritually is stress. Let me propose to you an idea. Do you think it would be possible to live without stress? In a stress-filled world where I got all these pressures, I got 15 teenagers, impossible. <laughs> How could you live without stress? If you read the newspaper, if you watch the news, wouldn't that be enough to stress you out? How could a person live without stress? Is it the invitation of Jesus to say, come to me and live without, but how am I going to? Stress. How would it be possible? Stress. What am I going to do about stress? See, everywhere you turn in your life, you build stress. How could you get away from stress? I've proposed this to you before, but let's do it again. I believe that stress biblically, is an ownership issue. Somebody says, you've got a lot on your plate. What if you didn't have a plate? <laughs> you couldn't get anything on your plate then, could you? <laughs> Refuse to have a plate. Come on, this is not that hard. When I go off for a revival, I get a rental car. Do you know how many times I check the oil? I do not. You think I give a rip whether there's oil in that engine or not? I do not. You know how many times I look at the tires and check the... I do not. Now, white lightning, I check the oil about two times a week. <laughs> Why? I own that car. <laughs> well, it's not much. It doesn't matter how good it is. It's mine. That's an ownership issue. Come on. Let's go shopping. Where are you going to go? Walmart. Where are you going to park? Right up here in front. It's awful tight. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's a rental. <laughs> See, I don't care. Why? I don't own the thing. See, it's amazing what happens to you when you own it. Oh, oh, we're not going to park in there. Where are you going to park? Out there. <laughs> well, that's two miles away. I don't have to walk. Why? I own this thing. Don't slam the door. Don't. See what ownership does to you? 
What would happen if you didn't own anything? Oh, no stress. But it's my life. Well, give it away. Well, who wants it? Come to me. Come to me. Come on, this is not that hard. Come to me. But I got it. No, you don't. Come to me. Come to me. But my family don't have a family. Get rid of your wife. <laughs> Give her to Jesus. You've never been able to handle her anyhow. <laughs> Woo! Is there a testimony in the house? <laughs> oh, get her off your neck, man. Don't live under that stress. My. Well, this is my ministry. Don't have a ministry. It'll eat you up. Why? People will not cooperate. <gasps> and it just stresses you out. You know how nice it is how wonderful it is to rest in jesus with no ownership come on Amen. well i got these problems why don't have them refuse them in the name of jesus refuse them let him have them let him carry them this is not fictitious folks this is not religious talk this is the reality of the invitation come to a state of peace. Rest. Rest. Oh, time is gone. Secondly, it's release. What it is, it's repose. It's release. Release from what? Release from guilt. Release from Oh, it's in the passage. See, it's the context. It's the Old Covenant context. Here's all the legalism of the Old Covenant. Here's all the laws. Oh, good night. I've got to do all of these things. Wouldn't it be interesting if you were released from all of those? How could that be? Because they've all, and we've talked about this, been fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And in the embrace of his person, I'm released. <gasps> That's phenomenal. Oh, the third one is refresh. He wants to refresh you. So the rest he's talking about is a state of peace. It's being exempt from all the ownership and the, and, and, and the Old Testament law. It's a refreshment. Oh, I want to read this to you. Here is the Amplified New Testament of this verse. Listen to this. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden and are overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your soul. Listen to the message. Here's the way he translates it. Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me. And you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Jesus, life beats us to death. We come bruised, worn out, don't know what to do, stressed out. Have to take pills to get mellow. Amen. 
filled with anxiety. Life has dealt such blows to us. We are emotionally exhausted. I'm too tired to move, God. I can't come. Could I just turn my head? Could I just feebly say tonight, Yes. And would you pull me to your heart? Would you refresh me? It's about... What's the ball bat that's hitting you over the head? What's the battle that you're fighting and it's whipping you? What's got you all up tight, bent out of shape, upset? What keeps you up at night? Where haven't you made it? What's the problem that's bigger than you are? What's the addiction that you can't crawl over the top of? It's whipping you. Oh, listen to him. Come to me. Come to me. Not figure it out. Not correct your theology. Not learn the right performing ceremonies. Not get, say the right words. Just come. Turn your head. Yes. To me. Why wouldn't you? If you are in a state of stress, turmoil, if life is whipping you, if you are exhausted, you have to be that way because you want to. Because you don't have to be. Jesus has given you an invitation. Come on, exhausted people. Come on, you folks who haven't got it together. Come on, you people who don't know what to do next. Come on, you failures. Come on, you individuals who've tried and tried and tried and have never made it. Come on, you who are whipped out by religion and the churches beat you to death. Come on, folks. Those of you who've been under the law and have just heaped burden after burden of the law and you've carried it and it's worn you out. Come on, folks. Would you join me tonight in embracing Jesus? A state of peace. Be obedient.